Happy New Year, Ty. 2023. Oh, Dude, I feel like... Crazy, dude. COVID was yesterday. That was three years ago. Next month. Three years ago next month is when it popped off. We're still talking about it, though. When, where did time go? 2023. I know. I mean, it, it, feel, it feels like back in the day when you were younger, 2023 was like this far off futuristic. Why are our cars not floating? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's funny walking, watching back to the future. You know, they predict, yeah. what was it, 2020 that they predicted? 2020 like or like 2018 or, 20, yeah, or 2018, something. 2018, yeah. something like that. And it Long gone. Just, they, were, they were way off with their yeah. prediction. Where are the floating skateboards? <laughs> that's, that's just funny what the mentality was in the 80s of what. Yeah, what, what Today our potential like. could be. Yeah. Gosh, we have just underperformed. Well, I mean, as far as we've advanced in a lot of things, a lot of things have stayed the same yeah. as well. Yeah. So it's just. The more things look. change, the more things stay the that's same. That's right. That's right. So uh, happy new year to you all listening. Um, if uh, you missed last week's episode, our last episode of 2022, uh, we're actually going through a book called Willpower, Why Self-Control is the Secret to success. The reason we want to go over this book now, obviously with the new year here, a lot of people are thinking about changes they want to make and new year's resolutions. We actually talked about last week why you shouldn't make new year's resolutions. We talked about uh, the secret to David Blaine, the, the famous magician, the secret to his success. We talked about why religious people live longer than non-religious people. Uh, we talked about why uh, Alcoholics Anonymous works so well and then just some other fundamentals about willpower. Today, we teased it last week. Tyler's excited. Um, today we're going to learn why participation trophies will keep your kid from getting into Harvard. We're going to learn why Asians are so successful and more successful than, than other cultural groups. We're going to learn about the challenges with single parent households. And then we're going to finish it off with a little willpower one-on-one five things to keep in mind regarding five, uh, fun- foundational principles when it comes to willpower. Uh, but let's start with the participation trophy era. Yep. And this is kind of a long read, so bear with me. Uh, that's not good for, for me to read a long time, but uh, we'll, we'll slodge through it. So the th- from the book, the theory of self-esteem was a well-intentioned attempt to use psychology for the public good, and it did indeed seem promising at first. The results inspired a movement led by psychotherapists like Nathaniel Brandon. Quote, I cannot think of a single psychological problem from anxiety and depression to fear of intimacy to spouse battery, to spouse battery or child molestation that is not traceable to the problem of low self-esteem, Brandon wrote. All this enthusiasm led to a new approach to child rearing imparted by psychologists, teachers, journalists, and artists. It was a novel but irresistible idea to the millions who began trying to improve children's academic skills by encouraging them to think, I'm really good at things. At home, parents practiced dispensing extra praise. Coaches made sure everyone got a trophy, not just the winners. All these affirmation exercises were supposed to do even more long-term good than conventional lessons. Yes, students with higher self-esteem did have higher grades, but which came first? Did student self-esteem lead to good grades or did good grades lead to self-esteem? It turned out that the grades in 10th grade predicted self-esteem in 12th grade, but self-esteem in 10th grade failed to predict grades in 12th grade. Thus, it seemed the grades came first and the self-esteem came after. In another carefully controlled study, Donald Forsyth tried boosting the self-esteem of some of the students in his psychology class at Virginia Commonwealth University. He randomly assigned some students who got a C grade or worse on the midterm to receive a weekly message boosting their self-esteem, and some students with similar grades to get a neutral weekly message. The weekly pep talks presumably helped the students feel better about themselves, but it didn't help their grades. Quite the contrary. When they took the final exam, not only did they do worse than the control group, but their grades were even lower than what they'd gotten in the midterm. After reviewing the scientific literature, the panel of psychologists concluded that there is no modern epidemic of low self-esteem, at least not in the United States, Canada, or Western Europe. Most people already feel good about themselves. Children in particular tend to start off with very positive views of themselves. Almost done. By most measures in psychological studies, narcissism has increased sharply in recent decades, especially among young Americans. The broad rise in narcissism is the problem child of the self-esteem movement, and it's not likely to change anytime soon because the movement persists despite the evidence that it's not making children become more successful, honest, or otherwise better (laughs) citizens. Too many students, parents, and educators are still seduced by the easy promise of self-esteem. 
like the students in Forsyth's class of Virginia, when the going gets tough, people with high self-esteem often decide they shouldn't bother. If other people can't appreciate how terrific they are, then that's the other people's problem. <laughs> I know that was a long read, but... Man, there's a lot. Okay, yeah. so... This is going to be unpopular, probably, with a lot of people. I can't wait. When, as a society, are we going to acknowledge that not everybody is going to be good? <laughs> humans are humans. Yes, we can improve the overall scope, and we can like say, hey, look, we want, we want everyone to be better than the last generation. We want to improve. But we've also ha we also have to acknowledge that pump some people just suck. Some people are mean. Some people are crazy. Some people are unathletic. Some people are not smart. Some people that doesn't mean that they can't provide value to society. Yep. But like when we generalize everybody, when everybody gets a participation trophy, trophy, what this is saying is exactly right. People don't get self esteem just because you tell them they're good. Mm -hmm. They get self esteem because they actually accomplish something and feel good about what they accomplished. So we're robbing, especially our youth, from telling them they're great, they're this. Like parents saying, yeah, you're an eight-year-old. You're going to get a college scholarship at football when you can't even freaking catch a football. <laughs> like, I'm, I'm tired of all that. Like, I'm tired of parents building their kids up. Their kids don't do any wrong. You know, they're in there being just a total ass in class, but it's the teacher's fault. It's the other kid's fault. It's somebody else's fault. It's never their fault because they're perfect, right? Because we, we, we need to build up their self-esteem and we need to tell them how great they are. And then now they just become a-holes. Mm -hmm. And guess what? That does nothing for them. That doesn't teach them to work. That doesn't teach them to actually go create results themselves, create value to their peers and to society. It doesn't do anything for them. All that does is create a bunch of worthless humans yeah. that do nothing for society. That Look, if you listen to the show and you go pick it and you go like some sort of demonstration somewhere and you don't have a job and you don't do anything, but then you're fighting for some right when you don't contribute anything to society, I'm talking to you. You can stop listening to our show. I don't care. But this idea of no 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 you're great you're the best at everything you should get an a we're going to fix your grade we're going to give you a trophy even though you sucked and actually almost cost the team the championship <laughs> no yeah hudson you suck <laughs> i'm sorry like this just it, it 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 drives me crazy and like as a parent i am constantly fighting the urge to just give my kids everything and to, to tell them how great they are at this like it's hard for me to tell my kid hey look dude like you're not the best kid on the team. You can't be quarterback. There's three other kids that are better than you. If you want to work and show me that you can be the best kid on the team at that position, then you can have a shot at it. But as the coach, I'm doing a disservice to everybody else. Even though you're my son, I can't just give you something that you haven't deserved. And that's what we're creating these people that, that are entitled because we've boosted their self-confidence and we, we, their self-esteem is through the roof and they think that they're the best. And it's like, no, we're doing a disservice. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I, as society, like this experiment, great. I, I, we had to vet it out. Mm -hmm. This experiment has failed. Let's move on. Let's actually judge people based on their contribution. Now, I'm not saying that your identity is built in performance. You do not have to, your value as a person is not based on what you do, right? And that's where I go back to faith and I struggle with that. But look, you are, you are an incredible person, but figure out the value that you can bring. And you want to talk about self-esteem, go do something hard and accomplish it. Something that makes you uncomfortable. Something that you don't know how to do. Learn a new skill. Learn a new trait. Be better at something. Improve. Tell me how your self-confidence. Prime example. Someone that may be 300 pounds. They lose 80 90, 100 pounds, down to 200 pounds, tell me their soft confidence isn't higher. Not because they look better. That's part of it. It's because they know that they accomplished a goal. Because of the work it took to lose the that The work weight. that it took. Not the, not the, I just have to show up, and I don't have to work because I'm still getting a trophy, still getting all the results. 
Like, let's move on from this experiment. Yeah. yeah, using that example, we've created a society that's accepting of, and yes, being accepting, but acting as if it's beneficial to be 300 pounds and massively overweight. Asking, acting as if it's a good thing because we want to spare somebody's feelings as opposed to encouraging being better because you're robbing them, to yeah. your point, you're robbing them of all that they can learn on that 100-pound weight loss yeah. journey. And I'm not saying go out and attack these people. No, of course not. Like, I'm not saying, oh, my gosh, like, you're stupid. You got to see on that. Like, that is not reinforcing positive behavior. Right. Like, encouraging, but encouraging in a way that, like, hey, you're capable of this, but you're going to have to put in some good work. If you need some help, I'm here to help you. Yep. Hey, you, you need to lose 150 pounds because you're you're diabetic now and you're susceptible to heart disease. Yeah, hey, look, you you do not have to live in this painful, unhealthy, unenjoyable way. Let me help you. It's gonna take some work, but let me help you. Like that's the approach we need to take. Teachers, right? It's not, hey, it's okay, guys. No homework anymore because we don't want you to feel pressure. Everybody, we're just gonna go in and then throw this freaking testing at mm -hmm. you and it's all about funding we're just like we're not doing anything for the kids and you know what everybody gets picked no you know what if you suck at dodgeball i don't want you on my team you're a liability because <laughs> yes that's what it'll teach you yes in that particular instance and it teach you well i better go yes. practice then I like go, go back and watch remember the titans as good looking as ryan gosling is he was a liability at corner and he got pulled he is not playing for the team <laughs> If you cannot perform, you watch your mouth about Mike, <laughs> Ryan. If you cannot perform, like I'm sorry, like you do not deserve to take the spot of somebody that can perform. Well, practically speaking, a corporation, a business cannot operate if they don't perform. And if you are being told your whole life that you're good enough and you're okay and your performance doesn't matter and everything's okay, here's a trophy anyway. Yeah. What's going to happen when you get that first job that is 100% performance based yeah. and you're not able to operate? Now, here's the problem. Here's the problem is that we, this is bled over into corporate America too. Mm -hmm. So now it's just, Hey, you just, we just need you in this position. You either are a minority so that we're going to put you in that position or you're, you fit this criteria or whatever. And now we've created people that hold companies hostage for that job. They contribute nothing to the company, but now we've reinforced this. Now it's the company's fault that you can't perform. It's the company. It's it's your coworker's fault that you're not you you're not able to actually do the job that yeah. is associated with your title. It's everybody else's fault. So now you hold the company hostage because of lawsuits right. or something, right? Well, the Twitter is a good example of this. The whole Twitter deal. You know, when Elon took over, there was a video that went out before he took over. Some girl did a TikTok of, like, her day in the life of a, of a Twitter employee. Yeah. And it was basically, like, getting coffee and hanging out with friends all day long. Yep. It was, there was really no work being done. And he comes in, fires however many people, and, yeah. and, and, is turning, and per, apparently Twitter is performing better than it's ever performed. I think it's a perfect storm. You know, our parents were raised by a tough, hard yes. generation. Yep that had seen war, had seen depression, had seen a lot of bad times. Yeah. And so I get the draw of, well, I hated my experience growing up. I'm going to do it completely different for my kids. And that's us. That's me and you. That's yep. the millennial generation. We're the first generation that's being raised in such a thriving environment mm -hmm. that, that didn't have a lot of, we haven't had a lot of hardship in, in mine in your life. Yeah. And so I get the draw. In fact, I was listening to a, a podcast the other day, and the the two were talking, and the guy that was being interviewed was saying how his dad was extremely hard on him growing up, like so hard on him, you know, almost, you know, it, in some ways kind of like, oh, that is maybe a little bit much, but yeah. just, just wanted him to be, you know, so great at everything. And now this guy on paper has is ultra successful. He's yeah. done everything, and he's actually appreciative of his dad now yeah he may not have liked it very much growing up but he's appreciative of the way his dad raised him but it's interesting because yeah. then they started getting the discussion of how he's raising his kids now which is the complete opposite yeah and so the discussion was like if if that worked for you yeah. if your dad being hard on you and challenging you was such a good thing for you why would you now go do something completely different do something completely different yeah. and again so i get the draw you don't want to be mean yeah 
But, and we've talked about this before, you don't want your kids to struggle, but they have to. It's just part of yeah. growing and, and bettering yourself as a human yeah. being. Yeah, and like, I think it's, it's hard, right? Because we should always be striving for being better and the best, right? And so you look at a generation, and you maybe see, maybe you see that generation that you mentioned that, that went through, you know, World War II and, you know, a boom in the U.S. economy after World War II and, you know, really hard workers and really gritty. And, um, and then maybe you see some of the problems that are associated with that, like systemic racism, alcoholism. Yeah, a lot of faults the, for there, sure. There, there's a lot of things. Where, oh, no, 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 that's wrong. Yeah. But, like, what came out of that, there were some good things. And so we abandoned everything to create something new. And that's, that's what I feel like is, and we're going through this right now, even like this Gen Z generation is like, you guys are stupid. We're going to recreate everything and do everything as opposed to, Hey, let's, let's actually acknowledge history. Let's look what happened to the baby boomers. Like what was going on with them? Let's, let's look at millennials. Let's look at like, what are some good things that we can learn, continue to do, but then evolve and adjust and innovate to create a more efficient? So, like, it, it is best, but, like, to say, hey, like, there was this problem. Like, there was, you know, uh, uh, there, there was a legitimate issue with racism and, um, and genderism, whatever you want to call it, right? Uh, so, we're going to abandon everything that they did. We're going to start over. And all, all we're doing is now just creating something that we don't have any data on, and we're just guessing that this is going to work. And so, again, back to my original point, we've got to acknowledge that not everybody's going to be perfect. Mm -hmm. And not everybody, not any system or plan or method or, um, or teaching is going to be perfect. And understand that it's not going to reach everybody the same. And there's just going to be some a-holes out there mm -hmm. that, look, you chose this, those are the consequences. We're not going to tell you you're good. Those are your consequences, live with them. And I just, I don't know, I just, yeah. it's, yeah. I think you nailed it in that there's a flaw in our hardware that we want results now in the quickest yeah. way possible. Yeah. And so to your point, I'm, I'm convinced now more than ever that we just don't have the ability to, to resist overcorrection. Yeah we have to go to the extreme opposite end yeah. with everything we do. As small as weight loss and we want to lose 100 pounds this week or as big as societal change where we want to change completely. So instead of taking, like you said, the good things that our parents did and improving upon that yeah. and taking slow, gradual improvement over time, yeah. we want the quick fix. Yeah. Well, maybe they did some good things, but they did a lot of bad things. So let's do the complete opposite. Of yeah. That. So yeah. we overcorrect the other way. Yeah. It, literally every aspect of our life, we just have the tendency to overcorrect. And maybe, and maybe I, I need to rephrase it. Maybe it wasn't very clear. Is we if it if that method doesn't work for everybody and it doesn't include everybody, then it doesn't work and we shouldn't use it. Yeah. Understand that people respond to things differently. Like if there is you know a way to teach or there's a way to raise or there's a way to coach or there's a way a method to that. And it can create some really great things out of it for some people. Don't just abandon it because not everybody connects with it. Yeah. Right. That's like military. I mean, we, we look at, you know, recently the, uh, the Navy SEALs have been criticized and Special Forces have been criticized for some of their training habits and that like they tear gas people. Right. And we talked about this a little bit. Okay. Oh, no, 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 no. These, uh, you know, these liberals over here that are working for a biotech company in Boston think that that's inhumane. So now you can't do that. You can't implement that. It has nothing to do with you. So don't try to make this everybody masses. You tell me those soldiers that have gone to war and gone to battle in Afghanistan or, or, or Vietnam prior to that, that they were not exposed to those things. So you're t saying that don't train them to be effective through all of that adversity that they're going to actually face in battle that you know nothing about. And that's where we're like, it struggles with me. And this is back to the participation trophy. Everybody's the same and everybody, no, people are different. Mm -hmm. People require different things, allow different, different regimens to be implemented for different people. That's right. 
That's right. So boycott participation yeah. trophies is, is the short. Yeah, long answer. story short. Yeah. Uh, but which leads us into why Asians are so successful, actually. <laughs> See, everybody's different. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Some Asian cultures put considerably more emphasis on promoting self control and from an earlier age than in common than it, than that is common in America and other Western societies. Cultural traditions in China and other Asian countries undoubtedly play an important role in instilling self-discipline. And those traditions in Asian American homes have contributed to the children's low levels of narcissism as well as their later successes. Asian Americans make up only 4% of the U.S. population, but account for a quarter of the student body at elite universities like Stanford, Columbia, and Cornell. They're more likely to get a college degree than any other ethnic group. And they go on to earn salaries that are 25% higher, that are 25% above the American norm. The many Asian American success stories have forced developmental psychologists to revise their theories about proper parenting. They used to warn against the, quote, authoritarian style in which parents set rigid goals and enforce strict rules without much overt concern for the child's feelings. Parents were advised to adopt a different style called authoritative authoritative in which they still set limits but gave more autonomy and paid more attention to the child's desires this warmer more nurturing style was supposed to produce well-adjusted self-confident children who would do better academically and socially than those from authoritarian homes but then psychologists studied asian american families they noticed that many of the parents set quite strict rules and goals these immigrants and often their children too considered their style of parenting to be a form of devotion, not oppression. These parents might have seemed cold and rigid by American standards, but that their children were flourishing both in and out of school. Chinese parents have two things over their Western counterparts, higher dreams for their children and higher regard for their children in the sense of knowing how much they can take. Set clear goals, enforce rules, punish failure, reward excellence. Forget about self-esteem, work on self-control. Yes. The Asians nailed it. Dude, I love that. I love it. Because here's the thing, is kids are pliable. They, especially young kids, they don't know any different. And they can adjust more than we give them credit for. So when you set a goal and you hold them accountable to that goal, they don't know any different. So I love the, I love the, what, what you're just talking about, right? Within the Asian cultures, it's like, Look, guys, this is the standard. Like, here's the bar. Mm-hmm. Like, you don't know any any different. Now we've got a bunch of a bunch of other kids that parents are like, oh no, you can just do whatever you want, whatever makes you happy. Like, disrespect your teacher, doesn't matter. It's not it's your teacher's fault. fault. It's a teacher's yeah. fault. Yeah. Right. So now we're influencing like these Asian kids that have like standards to live up to. And it's like, we're bringing them down, right? But the point is, is if you set standards. You discipline failures, celebrate wins. Like that is what it is. And, and again, you create aspirational goals for them to reach and to work for. Like, and those are habits that you create early with, with kids. And it's not the like, you can be whatever you want. Like, no, like you, you can be these high profile, like, these high income, high opportunity, high influence positions. Now here's how you get there and creating goals and then keeping them accountable to it. I mean, kids love structure, love structure. Kids thrive within structure. I mean, I know that like other like teenagers, like what What the hell are you talking about? That's not a popular opinion. No, but they thrive in structure. Absolutely. When you, when you get that, when you just let them go off the Richter, that's when, that's when you got issues and, the Asian culture just has it figured out. Like the idea that 4% of our population occupies 25% of college enrollment. Mm-hmm. That's wild. Yeah. Well, they earn 25% higher and they 25% earn, yeah. higher than yeah, any but other. They're, yeah, they're yeah. more, they're more likely to go to the, yeah. And, and obviously wild. there's a lot of flaws in the, in the, <laughs> you know, in China and things like that, the Asian culture, there's a lot of flaws, but the discipline aspect, I don't think you can argue. I mean, think about American society. We're headed in the wrong direction in basically every single statistic regarding education. Uh We're headed in the wrong direction in every statistic regarding marriages. We're headed in the wrong direction in every statistic regarding morality. Pretty much the only thing we're improving on in a horrible way is our suicide and depression. Yep. So 
all these things are decreasing because we're letting everybody just be you and be free and believe your own truth and do what you want to do. And yet depression, suicide, anxiety is at an all time high. Mm -hmm. You can't tell me those two things aren't correlated. Yeah. So we think we're helping people by accepting and being free and open. And all we're doing is creating more heartache. Yeah. So how, how do we not well, see that? It, there's, there's a difference between self-esteem, right? Building someone up, telling them they're good, and then self-confidence. Self-confidence is I know that I can complete this task or I know that I'm capable of this or I know that I'm doing it. And how do you get self-confidence? By actually executing those things or executing the process to get to those things. That's how you get self-confidence. When we're just telling people, we're creating false sense of self-esteem, right? We're just telling you you're good, telling you you're you know, elite, all these things, and you haven't competed it. You have this conflicting idea in your head because now you talk about depression, suicide, all these things. What it is, is I'm not good enough for that. All it's counterintuitive. Like I hear that I'm this, I've got this, I've got this persona that I've got to live to because I've been told this my whole life, but I really don't believe that I can do that. I struggle with that. Like I struggle with, you know, oh my gosh, you're going to do this or you're going to do that. And you're like, and in my head, I'm like, I've never done anything like that. I don't think I can do that. I don't think I'm good enough for that. And that's what we're reinforcing to these kids is by pumping up their ego. That's what we're doing is we're pumping up ego, but we're not giving them the tools to actually go execute and do the things that we say that they can do. Yeah, this is an official statistic, but I always used to hear this when I was in my old management job. Only 2% of people are self-managed, hmm. meaning 98% of us need feedback, need coaching, need help in improving ourselves. We can't do it on our own. And so if you're sitting there telling somebody who's failing a class, I'm just trying to think about that example we mentioned a few minutes ago. If I was making a C grade or a D grade in a class and my professor was telling me weekly how good I'm doing, mm -hmm. how awesome, where's the incentive? Yeah. Where's the urgency? Other than maybe me personally having that within me, but not all of us have that. Where's the urgency and the incentive for me to want to improve? Right. I know my grades suck, but my professor who is in controlling my grades is sitting here and telling me how good I am. Yeah. Where's the urgency for me to change? Right. Why would I want to change? Yeah. I'm doing just fine. As a human being, it is my single life's mission to be comfortable. Yeah. And not to be forced out of my comfort. And so if nothing's going to force me out of my comfort zone, I'm not going to push it out myself. Yeah. Some of us will, but the majority of us won't. Right. And so if I'm constantly being fed this idea that I'm good, I'm okay, I'm worth it, I'm special, when I haven't done anything to deserve those things, how is that helping anybody out? Yeah. Yes, in the short term, it makes me feel good. But in the long term, you're, you're robbing me of my future yeah. by telling me those things, by raising me in that certain way. Mm -hmm. So yes, you think you're helping your kids by not letting them struggle. You're robbing your kids of any sort of future. So like it anyway, um, the challenges with single parent households, this was, uh, it's kind of random to throw in, but it's, it was just, it was just interesting and it reinforces conversations we've had before. So as a general rule with lots of exceptions, children raised by single parents tend to not do as well in life as children who grow up with two parents, even after research is controlled with socioeconomic, socioeconomic factors and other variables. It turns out that children from two parent homes get better grades in school. They're healthier and better adjusted emotionally. They have more satisfying social lives and engage in less antisocial behavior. They're more likely to attend an elite university and less likely to go to prison. One possible explanation is that children in one parent homes start off with a genetic disadvantage in self-control. <laughs> After all, if the father has run off and abandoned the family, he may have genes favoring impulsive behavior and undermining self-control, and his children might have inherited those same genes. Whatever role is played by genes, there's an obvious environmental factor affecting children in single parent homes. They're being watched by fewer eyes. Monitoring is a crucial aspect of self-control, and two parents can generally do a better job of monitoring. Single parents are so busy with essential tasks, putting food on the table, keeping the child healthy, paying bills, that they have to put a lower priority on making and enforcing rules. Two parents can divide the work, leaving them both with more time and energy to spend building the child's character. More dull eyes make a difference, and quite a lasting difference. So... Certainly don't read that to condemn anybody, to make anybody feel bad. You know, whatever your situation, there's lots of reasons why yeah. people have to raise kids by themselves. Yep. It's a simple 
Fact of the matter, statistically speaking, though, your kids are going to have better odds at being successful yep. if there's two people able to monitor, able to guide, able to feed into yeah. that and, child. And there's the nuance of – there's examples of where one single parent is better than two parents that are Absolutely. detached, yep. not, not intentional, mm -hmm. not present. So, again, that's just the odds – Right. The odds of it. So let's just be very Not impossible, clear. but the yeah. odds are. Yep. So I think, but, but, you know, a great example of a single mother that did an amazing job. Just one example of somebody we know is Darren. Yeah. Darren's mother. Darren is one of the best men I know, was raised by a single mother. Yep. So it is possible. Mm -hmm. It's just a lot harder. Yep. And so if nothing else, that segment encourages me as a father who is married and has kids it just it's just more motivation, more encouragement to make that relationship work. Right. If 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 nothing else, you've got I've got three lives depending on it. Yep. Depending on my marriage to be successful That's and right. work. Obviously it's gonna impact me, but it's also gonna impact them. That's right. So I just thought that was an interesting section. And then we'll wrap it up, wrap up this book, wrap up this uh, this episode in this section. With a little willpower 101, five things to keep in mind. We'll fly through these. Number one, know your limits. No matter what you want to achieve, playing offense begins by recognizing two basic lessons. Your supply of willpower is limited, and you use the same resource for many different things. Each day may start off with your stock of willpower fresh or renewed, but then all day things chip away at it. The willpower you expend on each of your unrelenting events depletes how much you have left for others. Um... Remember too that what happens in exertion, not what hap what matters is the exertion, not the outcome. If you struggle with temptation and then give in, you're still depleted because you struggled. Giving in does not replenish the willpower you have already expended. All it does is save you from expending anymore. So I thought that was interesting. If you're walking by the plate of cookies and you're constantly struggling to resist that temptation and then you finally give in, it's not like you get all that back. Get all that back. Yeah. You already expended the willpower and you ate the cookie. Yep. So it's the, the worst of both worlds. Uh, number two, pick your battles. You can't control or even predict the stresses that come into your life, but you can use the calm periods or at least the peaceful moments to play to plan an offense. When you pick your battles, look beyond the immediate challenges and put your life in perspective. You can't do this every day, of course, and certainly not during busy, stressful times, but you can set aside at least one day a year, maybe your birthday, to do some reflection and write down notes on how well you spent the previous year. If you make this an annual ritual, you can look back over your notes from the previous years to see what kind of progress you made in the past, which goals were met, which goals remain, and which goals are hopeless. So I thought that was good, especially this time of year as we're reflecting, and maybe you should have already done this the last few weeks, but as you're reflecting over a year, you know, you don't have to do it every day, but see what you did well this year. Yeah. Write it down. Uh, number three, beware the planning fallacy. Tyler, I think this one's talking to you. Whenever you set a goal, beware of what psychologists call the planning fallacy. The planning fallacy can affect just about everyone, but it takes a special toll on procrastinators who expect to get the job done in one concentrated burst of effort at the last minute. Mm -hmm. This strategy might work if they left themselves a big enough chunk of time right before the deadline, mm -hmm. but they won't do that. They'll underestimate how long the work will take, and then they'll discover that they don't have enough time left to do it well. One way to avoid the planning fallacy is to force yourself to think about your past. Uh, by following the management technique Aaron Pratzer used to guide Mint.com from a small startup to a company tracking the finances of millions of people. Quote, we simply ask our managers and other workers to set their top goals for the week, Pratzer says. You can't have more than three goals, and it's fine if you have less than three. Each week we go over what we did last week and whether we met these goals or not. And then each person sets the top three goals for the week. If you only get goals, if you only get goals one and two done, but not three, that's fine. But you can't go off working on other goals until you've done the top three. That's it. That's how we manage. It's simple, but it forces you to prioritize. It's good. One argument is if you save it to the last minute, it only takes you a minute to finish it. <laughs> that's true. <laughs> It always takes as much time as you give yourself. So that, that's a fact. I just, yeah, if I give myself five minutes, I'm going to get it done in five the minutes. The absolute, <laughs> like, the the anxiety, though, that you uh, live with by waiting to the last you, minute. Oh. You're literally taking years off your life oh, by doing man. that. Oh, man. Uh, number four, don't forget the basics. As you start working towards your goal, your brain will automatically economize 
on willpower, expenditures, and other ways. Self-control will be the most effective if you take good basic care of your body, starting with diet and sleep. Arrested will is a stronger will. Another simple old-fashioned way to boost your willpower is to expend a little of it on neatness. You may not care about whether your bed is made and your desk is clean, but these environmental cues subtly influence your brain and your behavior, making it ultimately less of a strain to maintain self-discipline. Order seems to be contagious. For all you uh, sloppies out there. And then lastly, keep track. Monitoring is crucial for any kind of plan you make, and it can even work if you don't make a plan at all. The more carefully you keep track, the better. Besides offering immediate encouragement, monitoring lets you improve your long-term planning. If you keep records, you can periodically check how far you've come so that you can set more realistic goals for the future. So, number one, know your limits. Number two, pick your battles. Three, beware of the planning fallacy. Four, don't forget the basics. And five, keep track. A little willpower 101 for you. Like it. So, that's it. Uh, we'll conclude um, with a little uh, excerpt here from the book to finish this out. But uh, overall, takeaways, thoughts, kind of a quick review this go around. Um, I would highly encourage anybody yeah. if you're interested to, like I said, there's so much more in this book that you, that you want to check out yourself. Go check it out. Yeah. Um, I mean, I, I feel like we're in a um, willpower epidemic right now. So I think that this is something that um, we are we are missing and it I think we overcomplicate it as well right we we try to create really complex systems because we're smarter than the generation before us I think this book does a really good job of just simplifying it like look it's don't overcomplicate things don't make it out to something that it's not it's going to take more energy more time all these things like you may think hey work smarter not harder creating a new deal look there's proven methods willpower is really important there's a finite amount of it. Here's how to use it. Yeah. Yeah. I think for me, just based on my life stage, the t- my biggest takeaway is not being my kid's friend, being their parent. Yeah. Okay. Challenge them, set structure, discipline. They may not always like it, but they will appreciate it yeah. and they'll respect you down the long run. Again, that's just a reminder I've got to tell myself because I want to be the cool dad. I want to yeah. be fun, but I'm actually taking away from my kid when I try to be the cool and fun dad only. Yes. And I'm actually helping them. If, if my goal, and that is my goal, is to help them have the most successful possible life that they could have. Yeah. Me being tough on them and setting structure in this, these younger years is the best thing I can do. That's right. I mean, who wants to be friends with an eight-year-old anyways? Right. Yeah. Eight-year-olds suck. Like, be, be a parent. Be someone that sets them up for success. So when they're an adult and you actually can relate to things, be friends then. Yeah. Yeah. I, that's one thing I, I, not one thing, there's a lot of things I do, but one of the things I really respect about my dad is he was that, he was not my friend as a kid. Mm-hmm. Not, I mean, it was, look, here's the expectation. If you miss it, discipline. Mm-hmm. If you exceed it, we're going to celebrate it, but pl- don't confuse that we're friends and that we're buddy, buddy. Yeah. Like you'll show respect, you'll show all those things. And then we now, I mean, like one of my favorite times are just hanging out with him. And we made that transition when I was like 23 or 24. And it's, it was the first time I actually like really connected on a yeah. deeper level with my dad. So how many times, and not, we don't need to go too far, but just quick follow up. Growing up, were there times that you did not like your dad oh, because, of constantly. What, because of what he did to you? I, and I'll never forget this. Never. I, there was a period I hated him. Mm. And it was, it was ignorant. It was stupid on my part looking back. Yeah. But it was like he like restricted how much social life I had. And I remember telling him this, and it's still like, like it's like nails on a chalkboard every time I say it. But I remember like yelling at him one time. Oh, and I got disciplined. (laughs) I was like, just because you were a loser in high school doesn't mean I need to be one. Oh, yeah. And uh, yeah, Scott, what do you think about that one? That's that's tough. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. My wife, my wife, not to put my wife on blast, she told her parents she hated him. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I hate you. I've said, I, I, yeah. but it took a lot for me to say it. Yeah. It took a lot for me to say it, but I've, I said it a couple of times and it was like stuff that I look at now. I'm like, thank you for not being, not just giving in. Yeah. So all those times where you disliked them, yeah. you may have quote hated them. And now look at you sitting back. That's raising your own my kids. wife and my wife and uh, her mom, Tiffany, they're literally best friends. They talk twice a day. 
like best friends. And Tiffany, like her mom was such a disciplinarian, had standards for her, like, hey, look, this is, th these are the rules in our family. If you go outside of them, then you will be in trouble. Like there was a period she couldn't go to like birthday parties with that boys were at for like three years because she snuck like a two piece swimsuit to like a pool party. Sorry, babe, I'm throwing you on blast. Yeah. She couldn't go to birthday and she was so mad at her mom and didn't get along with her mom until she was 20, 21 years old. Yeah. Well, it's, and not to say that either one of y'all's parents are perfect or my parents are perfect, but yeah. it is interesting that it's like the whole delayed gratification yeah. thing. You're putting off being best friends with your kids when they're young yeah. and being disciplined so that now when they're 30, yeah. 35, yeah. now you can be best friends. But you friends know what though, man? Like this is, we are a product. Our generation as parents, we are a product of being raised in a way that we need to be liked by everybody. Our self-esteem to like boost who we are is being told that we're liked. And so even to the point where we need to be liked by our kids to, to, uh, substantialize ourselves as parents to to confirm that yes we're good parents because my kids like me like our parents generation being raised by the greatest generation in America like they didn't care as much about being liked mm -hmm. and that's where I think we struggle as parents is like we are sacrificing key opportunities to raise our kids and and to to create like successful opportunities for our kids because we want to, we would rather be liked as opposed to doing what they need. Yeah. The bad news is we can't change society today. The good news is you and I in our homes right. can, t can do exactly what we're talking about. Yep. We can take the good things our parents did. We can improve on those things yep. and then raise up our children yep. even better. That's not, right. not go the complete opposite way of what our parents did because we didn't like it growing That's up because right. we appreciated what they did. Right. So, Appreciate uh, you. go check out that book again. It's willpower. Why self-control is the secret to success by Roy Baumeister and John Tierney. Uh, going to finish it off with this. Um, happy 2023 to you, Ty. Let's go. Happy you too, 2023 buddy. to you guys. Listen, we appreciate y'all. We uh, look forward to another great year uh, of the podcast. We'll end today's episode, the first episode of 2023 with this. The point of self-control isn't simply to be more quote productive. In the 19th century, the typical worker had barely an hour of free time per day and didn't even think about retiring. Today, we spend about a fifth of our adult waking hours on the job. The remaining time is an astonishing gift, an unprecedented blessing in human history, but it takes an unprecedented type of self-control to enjoy it. Self-control is ultimately much more than self-help. It's essential for savoring your time on earth and sharing joy with the people you love. People with stronger willpower are more altruistic and more likely to donate to charity, to do volunteer work, and to offer their own homes as shelter to someone with no place to go. Willpower evolved because it was crucial for our ancestors to get along with the rest of the clan, and it's still serving that purpose today. Inner discipline still leads to outer kindness. Our willpower has made us the most adaptable creatures on the planet, and we're rediscovering how to help one another use it. We're learning, once again, that willpower is the virtue that sets our species apart. And that makes each one of us strong. Appreciate you guys. See you next week. <laughs>